Okay, well, thank you for being here, and thank you so much for inviting me to present. And um, you're welcome to ask questions during my talk. That's fine. And I'm going to talk about my um, breeding program, and I'm not going to talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning per se, but it definitely underlies a lot of what uh, the results that I am presenting. So, you know, I'm going to be presenting genomic selection results and a lot of um, image analysis. And so there's algorithms and, um, and uh, uh, well, and I had some examples written from Elaine Karsak. So Elaine Karsavier was my student. And, uh, but anyway, like calculation of genetic correlation, all those things are types of machine learning, right? So um, I, before proceeding with some of our w work with phenomics in soybean breeding, um, I just want to mention that a lot of, all of my work using drones is in collaboration with Dr. Keith Turkauer in ag and biological engineering at Purdue. So he's um, expert in remote sensing. That's an older drone that, he, that we used to use. So um, anyway, a lot of these were, and so his, he and his students have contributed to this work. And I just want to emphasize that um, we've been flying UAS or drones, I like to say UAS, unmanned aerial systems, uh, over soybeans since 2013. Uh, but we really got started in 2015 and uh, quickly decided to go beyond our, so here, this is West Lafayette, Indiana over here, and this is our main sort of farm for the agronomy department. Uh, but starting in 2017, we started collecting data from multiple locations because I think it's important to understand um, the environmental influences and, and it helps you get a better estimate of your genetic effects to have multiple environments of data. <coughs> um, so I have a breeding program. Uh, this is a figure just made for 2019 where we have a total of 14,000 plots this year. Um, and it's sort of divided amongst the types of experiments this way. We have probably more preliminary yield trial plots than might be expected because we do a lot of selection experiments, trying to select soybeans the way they might normally be selected in a typical way in a breeding pipeline, comparing that to using new sources of data. So that tends to inflate uh, the numbers we have in our preliminary yield trials. Uh, so, and then we have a lot of, you know, experiments that aren't in the breeding pipeline around genetics. So I, I believe this is maybe similar in size to uh, Dr. Baldine's program. So it is a breeding program, it is a breeding pipeline, and it's a good uh, infrastructure to leverage for doing um, phenomics, because we're already collecting a lot of information. And as well, in a breeding pipeline, there's a lot of phenotypic variation for yield, which I'm gonna talk about. So, um, just gonna go over a little bit of rationale for why a breeder might want to use UAS information in their breeding pipeline and around the framework of genetic gain, which the equation for that is here. Genetic gain, the amount of increase in performance achieved through genetic improvement programs can be expressed a number of different ways. But I've broken it down into a few things here. So to improve the rate of gain, or the amount of increase we have per cycle, we can increase the additive genetic variance. We can decrease the amount of time required for each cycle. We can increase the accuracy of our phenotyping and selection. How accurate are we? And we can increase our selection intensity, so taking a smaller portion of our material. <coughs> and so this is a quote that's often used in biology from Alice in Wonderland, where the queen tells Alice, it takes all the running you can do just to stay in one place. So to get somewhere else, you have to run even faster than that, right? So to maintain our current rates of genetic gain, take all of the effort, as you know, many of you know, working in a breeding pipeline. So if we want to go somewhere else, increase our gain, we have to do things differently, right? The main, obvious, the best way to, to increase gain is to reduce cycle time, which is the, uh, the goal with all of this genomic prediction that we're talking about, right? 
And I don't think that UAS have much application in reducing cycle time. Um, potentially, and only the private sector breeders with their ultra-optimized three generations a year of selection maybe can understand where those opportunities are. So then we're left with um, the, the first and then the last two points. And um, I think one of the biggest opportunities is, is the ability to screen more material and take less of it because the drones are perhaps predicting yield, predicting the top 20% of yielders and allowing us to, in real time during the season, focus our data collection efforts to predict the best material. Okay, and then, um, so here, it would be in increasing our added genetic variance by allowing us to accommodate more entries, as well as maybe reduce our plot size and things like that to, 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 um, because we can adjust our yield measurements with drone covariates. Um, and then just, there's potential to increase these two things, though you don't have a really great linear relationship between R and I and, and G. I won't get into it, but limited opportunities. So um, a lot of the drone work initially, a few years back, with, with Keith Trickhauer at Purdue and Ag and Biological Engineering involved his student, um, Anthony Hurst. And Anthony developed an image processing pipeline that we call multi-layer mosaics. And the, um, the, the main point of it is that as the UAS or drone is flying over your research plot, it's collecting multiple overlapping frame photos. This with RGB, let's just, limit, most of what I'm presenting is RGB and multi-spec, which is frame photos. And you have a targeted overlap, usually it's quite high, 80% overlap, meaning you, um, you know, you'd have a lot of redundant information in your images so that you can stitch them together. And, and the, a very typical approach is to generate a giant orthomosaic image from all of those drone photos. So to generate one big picture out of all of those. But with multi-layer mosaics, you're, you clip every image of every plot from all of these raw frame photos so that you can end up with five to 20 images of every plot for every sampling date. And there's some advantages there. Uh, to accuracy, but also processing time and, and uh, the ortho mosaics, if you have one huge image of your field, is very unwieldy computationally. <laughs> Requires high performance computing usually to deal with them. So we use these multi-layer mosaics, so most of what I'm presenting are outputs from that. Elaine Carr mentioned earlier this experiment that we did in, for his PhD that was with um, also my other student, Ben Hall, as well as Anthony Hurst from the previous slide. Um, we, were, where we were studying or participating in the soy NAM experiment, soybean nested association mapping experiment. That's a giant, over 5,000 recombinant inbred lines from 40 families, um, you know, multi-parent mapping population. And the goal was to map yield genes, so we were collecting yield data on over 5,000 unselected recombinant and bread lines. And then we decided to leverage that at Purdue with the drone imagery. And this is just an example of once you've clipped your um, uh, plot images, doing a segmentation to classify canopy pixels versus not canopy. So that's a machine learning algorithm right there. Um, and then you can turn that information over time into these distributions of canopy coverage from the experiment. So these are multiple histograms for showing canopy development throughout the season. This would be days after, oh, this is percentage canopy on different days. And then um, we took these observations from the ground and drones and fit them to logistic growth models. So this would be, you know, growth curves for 5,000 rills. And what it does is allow you to have some um, observations are true and some are predicted from the linear growth model, right? And then Elaine Carr took that information and generated into GWAS over time. This has gotten pretty common now. Um, and we weren't, it wasn't our original idea to do this, but it was one of the first published with real data for doing this. 
this is just a, this is a Manhattan plot. These are multiple Manhattan plots stacked up over time or development. So you're used to seeing the peaks the, that are indicating the significance of the association. And that information is now this heat map. This is indicating your significance or your p-value of the SNPs. And now we have time. Just imagine a bunch, if you took a bunch of Manhattan plots and looked at them from above and stacked them up. So it was just interesting to see that you have different regions of the genome controlling the trait at different points in development. And so this is a one approach to understanding genetics and development. And another theme I'll talk about is how some other ways we're looking at genetic control of traits that are continuously variable, right? So when you're talking about drone phenotyping, usually you're looking at temporal variation over time and development. And the traits are changing all the time. So it's, that can be pretty different for, um, for breeders to think about. The other thing, we, and Elenka already talked about it, this high genetic correlation to yield from the, the average canopy coverage. And he showed that equation for indirect selection, showing it would be more efficient to select on yield, and, or on canopy coverage. And Rodrigo was asking me, is that really true? So yeah, this number is pretty high. There's a couple of things going into it. One is that um, mainly the, uh, there's a, a wide range of um, maturity in the soy nam. So there's probably three or four weeks range of maturity. And then also, you know, there's a lot of um, phenotypic variants for yield, some very low yielding lines. And we're not used to, in agronomy, collecting yield data on low yielding lines, right? We do selection to get out of, get rid of low yielding lines, and we're not used to looking at yield data that has a lot of low yield information. So that's inflating it. The other piece of that equation for indirect selection that Elaine Carr presented that made the number so high, was it 1.14, um, was that, you know, the yield data were bad, right? Like if you have very small plots, your yield data is pretty low quality. So that, that goes into some of those numbers. So, so that was a, this was a great experiment. We were super excited about getting some of these results. It was our sort of first generation of a phenomic trait. Literally just the easiest thing we could think to do <laughs> with the drones. And but one of the things that I really learned from that, because I was, I've been saying, you know, Soinium had a lot of phenotypic variants for yield, is I learned don't look for yield-associated traits in elite lines which I, I don't, I saw a, a few years back, I saw some people trying to do that. We have these yield trials anyway, so let's try to get some more information out of them and, and look for things that predict yield in a yield trial. But all that material has already been selected for yield multiple times. So any phenotypic variance that's left over is what's not associated with yield usually, right? So you want to be careful if you're thinking about doing phenomics, what you're actually studying. And then I liked this quote I found from actually from Origin of the Species, where, um, Darwin actually observed that selection uh, by breeders, you know, may have, um, pr you know, produced results that they couldn't even have expected or wanted to happen. And so, you know, as we're selecting our elite varieties with yield, we're, we're, we're changing things in ways that we don't expect. And so I think to look within a breeding program for what predicts yield, you need to look for it in a wide range of materials. And so even association panels sometimes do not have good variation for yield. I think the ideal material for phenomics is, is segregating for yield and is unselected. So I developed this framework called the phenomic inference approach. And the goal is to combine quantitative genetics and the physiological growth analyses um, to make inferences for new remote sensing capabilities. So what you want is temporal quantitative variation in phenotypes that you assess on the ground and remotely. And you need a calibration panel, for usually, for your training and cross-validation approaches on the ground. Uh, you need you know, quantitative variation for grain yield, and you want to measure phenology, ph phenology. And speaking of phenology, usually there's, in any crop, a variable that you might want to control for that's going to swamp all of your signals, right? And so I mean it's maturity. In maize, it might be height. It could be genomic features. Depends on the crop. Um, and then you need your genome-wide markers to get your uh, for your variance decomposition to get your genetic correlation to yield, and maybe weather data. 
my lab is not good at this point at incorporating weather information into our phenomics studies. But from that, you can calculate, you know, the um, genetic and environmental variances through the, the variance decomposition, and you get your GWAS, um, which is useful, I think, mainly as a breeder to just confirm that there is a genetic basis to some of these new traits that we're measuring with remote sensing capabilities, right? When you've never looked at very much of this data, you might not even be confident that it really has a genetic basis. Um, you get those quantitative properties, like genetic correlation that Elaine Carr presented, which I think is really a great um, metric. And then you can develop your remote sensing prediction equations through the training and validation approaches if you have your calibration panel. So the point being, if you design your experiments well, you can really get a lot of information about a trait, that for about a new capability for remote sensing that you can then use to apply to your breeding program. So now I'm going to give an example of uh, some phenomics inference experiments that my other students have done. Um, I had a student who's now finished who came to my lab as a, with a master's in physiology, wanting to apply physiology in breeding, and set out to test or to measure the components of the Monteith equation in soybeans. So these are these components of yield, like uh, radiation efficiency of light interception, the conversion of the, light, uh, the uh, radiation into dry matter and the harvest index. And uh, this was designed by Dr. Miguel Lopez, who just finished his degree in my lab, and today is his first day as the director of agronomy at Sinacana in Colombia. Very proud of his position. And this was our attempt at creating a phenomic inference panel from Soinam, where we, in pink, is the data from many, many environments cumulatively of the Soinam experiment. And then we set out to restrict the maturity using BLUPS to just a few days. So we took, we used, we subsetted the uh, lines by maturity, restricted it, and then confirmed that, and then randomly picked about 400 lines, and confirmed that we still had a good distribution uh, for yield, so a nice um, variance there. So this was our way to, because there was a lot of, you know, maturity, the maturity correlation with yield was really swamping some of our, the signals in the original Swainam study. And then this is a lot of maybe too much what and not enough why, but I just want to <laughs> point out that in our design of our experiment, we had to calculate, collect biomass data in order to calculate the components of the Monteith equation. We had a calibration panel, a random subset of 100 of our lines, where biomass sampling was done really intensively. But this allows you to, de to develop your remote sensing prediction equation and then validate it in your other replications of data. Okay? Because biomass sampling, as you, can, as you all probably know, or you know, people who have done it, is extremely labor intensive. So you have to be smart about how you do it. This is just representing the data collection that we did in this phenomic inference panel from Soinam over three environments, one in 2017 and two in 2018, and how we got our RGB and multi-spec data from the drone, you know, approximately weekly, collecting biomass, heights, et cetera, for our ground reference data, and then also measuring phenology as, and also um, gas exchange traits. And just as a note, this was a, such, such a big experiment that Miguel and my other student, Fabiana Moreira, who was Dr. Baldin's student, master student, worked on this together and then sort of split the data that resulted. So now I'm going to present some of Fabiana's results first. It's still ongoing. She's going to hopefully graduate in November. She obviously went here. Um, and then she worked, she's been working closely with some, I just wanted to emphasize all my connections with Brazilians. I work a lot with Brazilians. I have lots of Brazilians in my lab. And we also collaborate with a new uh, professor at Purdue, uh, Luis Brito. He went to Vissosa. He's an uh, animal quantitative geneticist. And we work with his postdoc, Inaya. And actually, like, the, th the two of us, or the three of us with the lane car have, have taught short courses and things. And um, they, 
we've been trying to apply a new technique, not new, but a uh, technique from animal science called random regressions. Some of you may have read about that to understand genetics of development without uh, assuming any specific growth curve beforehand. And this is coming out of doing lact analysis of lactation curves in, in um, cattle. And so Fabiana has been working with them. We have a review paper coming out about that topic, hopefully. So Fabiana's attempts at biomass uh, prediction and genetic architecture are ongoing. So uh, I'll give you some preliminary results. This is our pipeline. I just want to point out that she calculates, calculates vegetation indices from multispectral data. So we now have a multilayer mosaic technique for multispectral information where you have multi, you know, we've quantified several different um, uh, wavelengths. And she does a principal component analysis of the log of the biomass. Um, and then, so she gets multiple indices. And then she does a linear regression, et cetera, and um, is able to predict biomass. So there's some pretty complex, actually, and she works with another Brazilian statistician at Purdue on this. So this is like the all Brazil project here, <laughs> except for me. So uh, I, anyway, it's just, uh, I've heard a lot of people, it's complicated. Um, and th sorry, this is hard to read. This is what she gave me. <laughs> and just over here, we see we get a really good, this is using the like calibration data into the validation data, a very good prediction for biomass. So I'm excited about that. Um, you know, R squares of 0 0.9, 0 0.93, you know, low, good correspondent, uh, correspondence between the predicted and observed. And then I won't go into the GWAS and things because this is still ongoing. This is just one approach she's taking. She just picked the top 20 SNPs and this is their SNP effects over time, and she's still exploring how to do this. So this is not, this is looking at, this is mapping the coefficients of a regression for each um, line across SNPs. And there's different ways to do this that she's exploring, but you can see the SNP effects are changing over time. So this is a different way of describing genetics of development from that heat map Manhattan plot I showed earlier, okay? But, you know, we may find that we don't have enough observations to do random regressions adequately. So that's always a challenge in crops. We just never have enough data <laughs> in, uh, to use what we intended. So now I'm going back to some of Miguel's work. Um, so this is the efficiency of, this is, uh, this is the components of the Monteith equation and grain yield in our phenomic inference panel. And he, he needed the biomass data to calculate radiation use efficiency. And so we had to compromise because Fabiana is still trying to predict it with the multispectral data and he had to finish. So this is using canopy coverage. Um, so it's a little different. We'll probably have an yet another paper coming out where hopefully we have our at full set of biomass data. So good variability amongst soy NAM families. You have families with different characteristics here. You'll have to read the paper. There's some nice insights into you know, what drives what. So just, again, GWAS helps you confirm the genetic basis, so he found some, just a few significant SNPs for uh, these three traits. I think none of the light interception ones had been reported before as anything. Radiation use efficiency, um, two of these QTL were previously reported for related traits like um, chlorophyll and, um, and something else that makes sense, I can't recall right now and then two are novel, and then harvest index, we had two QTL, and they were overlapping with things like seed weight and pod counts that had been reported previously. So that's kind of interesting. And so just to show, <laughs> now we're, these are, I, 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 I forgot to label these as genet uh, additive genetic correlations, not Pearson's correlations. So these are additive genetic correlations between the traits for all of the approximately 400 lines in the panel, and then the top and bottom 100 for yield, and you can see the correlation between light interception, which is roughly canopy coverage, has gone down quite a bit. So when you restrict the maturity and maybe have a smaller panel, it does go down. Um, there's some, so yeah, there's, there's a good, mod, especially in the top yielding 100 lines, you see you know, a decent genetic correlation between grain yield and the interception, light interception. 
And then um, these traits were very uh, predictable with using genomic selection. So good potential to improve them. Um, we hope to maybe not so much use them for genomic selection, but um, to predict them from a drone using, you know, predicting uh, radiation use efficiency from the drone if we can get the biomass um, finished. And then as part of calculating these components, Miguel also did thousands of observations of gas exchange parameters using three different LICORs. It was cute. I, I should have written down the numbers. But, um, and so we have a paper already published about photosynthesis and water use efficiency. And um, just wanted to, now th this is not a trait, these are not traits that you would ever try to select phenotypically because it's just too difficult to measure. Um, but I just wanted to point out they had a high heritability of photosynthesis rate of photosynthesis and water use efficiency. Um, additive, you know, additive genetic heritability too. So definitely room to improve these traits. And uh, they are very amenable to, or moderately amenable to genomic prediction, which would probably be the best place to use them. Okay, so moving on to one, another of Fabiana's exper experiments. This is now out, this is not in that phenomic inference panel that I described as, you know, which is some ongoing work. This is a selection experiment that we started in 2015, just using the canopy coverage data after got, getting the good results from Elaine Carr's study. And what we did is we went into my breeding program into our progeny rows. And progeny rows is the first phase of selection in soybean breeding and it's virtually at random, right? You can select them visually, you can collect yield data on small plots that aren't very, um, and the yield data aren't very good quality. So it's definitely a place where we can target improved selection or advanced selection models, definitely. In so in because soybean, as many of you know, does not produce very many seeds in the early generation. So we are really limited to the amount of, uh, our ability to do any kind of replication, et cetera. So not like corn, we <laughs> Get like five times as much seed. So I usually have about five or six thousand progeny rows. And so she took, developed three selection criteria in my progeny rows in 2015 and then in 2016. And this would just be in the breeding pipeline as it advances. And one of them was the average canopy coverage. One was yield from, you know, the combine on an, you know, about three meters, single row. And then yield with the average canopy coverage as a covariate. So just adjusting the yield data so that to have like a constant canopy coverage. And this is just showing the overlap in selection categories. So when you do a selection experiment, you know, you want there to be overlap, right? But not too much. And then these are results from preliminary yield trials and yield adjusted, or yield adjusted for RA. This paper should be coming out soon. It's been you know, accepted with minor revisions, and those have been submitted. So here we have our PYTs, uh, preliminary yield trials, classified into just early and late maturing from 2016, 2017, in our selection categories. And you can see, you know, here there's no difference in yield between lines selected with just drone data or yield. And just a little bit of difference between these two selection categories. So in 2016, it was, the result was you can select just on canopy coverage, which you can do in July without harvesting everything and get the same result. Now that just maybe shows you how bad the yield data are. And then um, we did see significant differences with the yield category having the highest yield on average in uh, 2017 selections. Though, you know, these are just distributions and breeders only care about the top ranking, right? Oh, why do we get this result? Why, would, why do we have like no significant difference here and then significant differences here? If we go back to the selection environment, you can see the canopy coverage development was really different. A lot of environmental variation there. Th this is, Chris here is, you know, five, nine. So you can see the soybeans are five and a half feet, almost six feet tall, which I don't, definitely is not typical for the North Central region. So very rangy. So that, you know, this is maybe a year where you wouldn't use canopy coverage data. I'm going to get back to that in a minute. What, 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 what do we do about this strong environmental influence on our traits? So tracking this through, now we have our advanced yield trials, early and late classified. 
So these would be lines, you know, selected two years previous as in the Prodigy rows. And then I just, we just picked the top 10 ranking lines and looked at what selection categories picked them. Because that's really what we care about in breeding, right? Just what's the top couple of ranking lines. And, and anything in red would never have been selected without drone data. And then the things in green here are the lines that were only selected with yield. And when you summarize it, you can see over 40 top ranking lines Yield adjusted for canopy coverage picked more. Okay, so you know you, there's no statistics there. <laughs> it's just a trend that breeders might want to pay attention to. So I think what it's doing when you have a single row, you're really susceptible to gaps or poor emergence or things like that. So maybe the canopy coverage data is just kind of evening out some of that variation in our selections. Okay, so um, and then taking it on to the preliminary yield trials last year. I had two very top ranking lines in the maturity group fours. This is a regional test of multiple public breeders in the, in the North Central region. And I think it's interesting that one of the lines was picked with canopy coverage and one was picked with yield. So that shows you the yield data weren't bad <laughs> and, the, and the canopy coverage was equivalent. So we'll see what it looks like, these trends moving forward. Um, th these are data from um, Diego Joaquin. Uh, this is an analysis using my public data from Soynam, and he's showing that, you know, you've got, this is the genetic, and I can't remember if this is genetic correlation or just correlation. I think it may be genetic. I can't remember. Over time to yield. I think Elaine Carr presented this too, or something similar. And, you know, it's, the average would be about 30 days after planting, so early season. But it's also sort of changing over time, or depending on your season, what year the information's coming from. And um, so I think one way to address this um, and I, is, um, and I got this tip talking to Jesse Poland this summer, is to model what, what equals yield in your advanced yield trials. To take your advanced yield trials where you've collected a lot of high quality yield data, and in that given season, looking at your longitudinal traits, what, what index or combination of longitudinal traits and when might be predicting yield in your advanced yield trial and then apply that model in your progeny row selection. So that's one way to deal with it. The disadvantage being that you would have to harvest everything <laughs> in your progeny rows. It's not gonna get rid of that problem of having to harvest everything. Does that, so that, that's one way to maybe deal with this is to not make assumptions and just model it every year with high quality yield data. Um, and then going back, if we had this experiment to do over, I think what we, what we should have done is um, in, these in these preliminary yield trials, taking a subset of all these lines and putting them in the short progeny row format as well, just so that we could show the correlation between the drone data and a small plot and a big plot in the same line. I think that would have been a great way to do that selection experiment in hindsight. Okay, so going back to this um, analysis of our Soynam canopy coverage data, uh, Diego Joaquin found an improvement in genomic selection accuracy you, if, when including the, the canopy coverage data. Okay, so pretty high improvement uh, in the accuracy of genomic selection using the, just the secondary traits being canopy coverage. So that's pretty promising that these secondary traits have a role. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, some, some ongoing or some new work. I also have a, a, a postdoc who's an engineer from Spain, uh, Monica Herrero Huerta, and she works on developing new phenotypes from our image data. And this is just a, a paper we have about uh, clipping plots out of multispectral orthomosaics. So this is not the MLM approach. Um, and then she's been working, she's an expert in 3D modeling and she's working on generating 3D models. So this is not a photograph of a soybean yield trial, it's a 3D model of it. Which comes from the um, point, you can generate a point cloud, as this is showing like where the drone, this, is, so this comes out of Pix40, I'm sure you guys have seen this. This is the point in space where the drone is, projecting down like where in the field it's actually photographing. So you can, for every plot, you're getting, you know, all these images from different perspectives, and you can use that to generate a point cloud to create 3D models of what's on the ground, right? 
And she has a paper on this, um, you know, calculating a point cloud of height, using some algorithms to then infer what the canopy volume is, uh, which is a proxy for biomass, and then, um, you know, describing the physiology of that. This is a, a, a sort of flattened height. These are the, the height measurements of the point cloud from a given plot of soybeans. And you can see there's a variability in height uh, within that plot. And this is actually comp comparing two different plots. I forget, the scale is, I can't remember the scale, but you can just see it's very different. So these plots have sort of similar distributions of variability, but the overall height is very different. And this is, I can't recall the scale. Some increment from the 3D model. So now, we're, we want to try to use this in the multi-layer mosaic approach. Here's the, looking at change in height from day 27 to these other days after planting across the field. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the software that we use. So again, we do not generate these huge ortho mosaics because you have to use the cloud to do that or high performance computing. So you can't, it's hard to generate these at the edge of the field. Okay, you, you, there's a delay in the information. But we use these multi-layer mosaics and it, the, the multi-layer mosaic approach clips every image of every plot from the raw overlapping drone images. And the software that we have provides several ortho-rectified and labeled clips of uniform pixel dimensions for, for every plot. And now I'm t and the, uh, the software has been, it's a Purdue technology that I have a startup uh, with my student to commercialize the software. This is an example of the outputs where you can see, you know, here's a plot, an image of a plot, and then it's all, they, it, it outputs them from the drone imagery labeled by range and row and sampling date, uh, your drone uh, platform and your whatever kind of metadata you want to tag it with. It also then, uh, well, anyway, I'll get to it in a minute. So the advantage of this approach is you don't have to use uh, expensive GPS, you don't have to use ground control points where you lay those targets out in the field and go get the GPS coordinates. It doesn't, you don't have to do that. You don't have to use shape files. You're not drawing orthogons on top of a giant image. It's very labor intensive or there's no um, digital train models, et, et cetera. So it gets rid of all of this and the whole thing is automated and it works in like 10 or 20 minutes for, you know, let's say three or four hectares of plot imagery um, at the edge of the field on, so Elaine Carr was talking about a Walmart laptop. So we want this to work on a Walmart laptop. Well, maybe a little better than that, like a $1,500 laptop with a $2,000 drone uh, with a pretty standard RGB camera. Um, and this is called edge computing, okay, doing your computation free from the cloud at the edge. This is an example of the user interface, pretty, um, just a few things you can measure right now. And this is an example of just the spreadsheet output where you have you know, every, your range in your row and the number of reps of images. And then you have crop cover, uh, green-red ratio. We also are able to measure stand counts and row length. And we're working on diff other metrics. Uh, one of the things I want to do is, is to, um, from these, all these images, apply the 3D modeling we want to get these 3D models, but, and, but instead of doing it on the whole orthomosy, when you do a 3D model of a crop field, the crop field is essentially flat, right? At a certain scale, it is very flat. So, you make, so um, we might get better accuracy from generating the 3D models on a plot-by-plot -plot basis, not for the entire field. So that's, we've applied for funding, we'll see, um, to try to, to do that. And then we might be able to generate these 3D models on the edge of the field. <coughs> but why do you, why should you care? Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting, this is an output of our software, which is the median canopy coverage is the heat map for all your plots. So you can get that at the edge of the field and you could use this for your sampling strategy right there. You could go fly your drone and decide I'm only going to collect data or tissue samples on a subset of these for whatever criteria you may have. So that's an example, you could kind of use your drone for scouting 
and then decide how you're going to approach your field data or sample collection. And you can also, the other benefit of computing at the edge of the field is that you can confirm that you've got the data that you want, right? A lot of, uh, those of us who've used drones have had experiences where you'd fly a drone and you don't find out for a week that, that it didn't work. Like maybe it was too windy, there was too many clouds, and you don't know that you got what you wanted. So you can refly your field if needed, if you know, if you have this really fast processing. <coughs> okay, so, all of you can go download, if you have drone data and you're, you're having a hard time with it, you can download, a f or you can contact us, my C the CEO, through the website, which I put in somewhere, and he can, he'll give you a, like a one month free trial to try it out. So you can process all your data from your uh, thesis in, in one month if you want and not have to pay for it. So <laughs> hope that you try that if you're having trouble with your drone data. Okay. So I'm probably doing pretty good for time, actually. Good. Yeah, but um, anyway, be happy to take some questions. Does someone have one question? Well, uh, I have one question. Mm, considering seed yield prediction and all the complexity related to that, uh, with um, physiological traits, um, uh, how, uh, how many physiological traits uh, a good predictor has to yeah. be? To predict yield with, with these physiological traits or longitudinal traits, well, assuming that you might be doing that from a drone because it's high throughput and non-destructive and inexpensive, right? So we'd use a drone to do it. And you want to have, obviously, a high genetic correlation to yield. But you also want it to be robust. So maybe that's robust in terms of your... Um, right now, you know, drones can really be blown around in the wind. Uh, you know, you don't want a trait that's sensitive to technical difficulties, right? And then you want something... If you want to predict yield, usually it's from multiple environments, so you need something cheap that you can take around to multiple environments. And the biggest thing is to try to get that multi-environment data. So yeah, it's probably a more practical answer than you expected, but I think right now the limitation to implementing some of this yield prediction is the practicality. Oh, and I forgot to tell you one story. The other reason to use it is if you can't collect your yield data. And that happened to a colleague as part of a project that we're all on. He, um, his progeny rose, it rained so much in Kansas last year that his, he couldn't harvest his trials for yield. They were just rotten. And uh, I was able to make selections for him with drone data and that was better than nothing, right? So he, you know, at least he had the canopy coverage to make his selections. So there's an example of sort of practicality. Thank you. Another question? Oh, so thank you, Dr. Kate, for your great lecture.